Previously on Gears. Well, I tell you, I mentioned it the other day when I came into the studio because um, I haven't really watched the Channel 199 uh, on DSTV regarding the Oscar Pistorius trial. But I turned on the other day and I was quite fascinated because um, I wanted to hear from somebody that has some knowledge when it comes to the psyche of people. So we don't have... Um, um, lawyers and those kind of things in here. We have uh, much more clever people. <laughs> For example, uh, it's great to welcome Stephen Farrow, who is a director and um, and a senior lecturer. I think I've got that that correct at the um, Center for Advanced, the Center for Applied Jungian Studies. Stephen. Uh, Jungian, is that the correct yeah, pronunciation? You got it. Okay. Right. So when I first saw it, I sat and went, okay, Jungian, and I thought Carl Jung, so I'm assuming that that's where the, the <laughs> parallel is. That's correct. You got it. Okay. Yeah. So what is the Center of Applied Jungian Studies? Just, I know it could be very complicated, but for a layman's person who's listening right now. It's uh, based on the work of Carl Gustav Jung, okay. um, the uh, Swiss uh, psychiatrist and uh, founder of analytical psychology. Um, and also work that has been done post his death, what they call post-Jungian work. Okay. Um, it's broadly in uh, what's known as the psychoanalytic uh, or depth psychological uh, domain. Um, and applied is really the focus, applying those ideas not only in a clinical setting, but, but also to cultural uh, and social uh, phenomena and looking at them through a Jungian lens. Okay. Now, is this something that, that, that people, are we born with all of these traits or are these traits now defined through the Jungian process? Um, well, Jung's idea is that we are born with certain innate predispositions so that we don't come into the world as a blank slate, as it were. Okay. So the, uh, the, he's the, the depth psychology generally, but I think Jungian specifically works on the premise that, in fact, uh, there are certain patterns that are pre-exist uh, the developmental history of the person. Um, and they have a significant uh, influence on the way they develop and the way their motivations, their uh, character, their personality, if you will. Okay, uh, and we're going to get to the to the Oscar trial. I'm just trying to get some some kind of uh, more of an un understanding of this. Who who um, as opposed to traditional psychologists, mm -hmm. okay, who mm -hmm. sit there and somebody says they they're having a bit of an issue, uh, I need some help, and a psychologist might talk them through and and give them advice. Uh, how does the Jungian experience differ um, to that? I mean, if I, how would I know if I need Jungian analysis, analysis <laughs> as opposed to traditional <laughs> analysis? Uh, that's probably a good question. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not certain how to answer that. <laughs> but, but let me say this, that uh, the actual process of analysis is probably not all that different from uh, any you know, you know, gen general psychotherapy. Okay. Um, it's also clinical work, it's also done in a therapeutic situation, one-on-one. -on -one. I think the significant difference comes in in that uh, Jungian psychology has a slightly different focus from, uh, let's say, most mainstream clinical psychology. Um, that being said, there, you know, there, there is sort of a, you know, the, these systems do influence each other, and, and one may well come across a clinical psychologist that has a strong Jungian influence. Okay. But the difference really is in the approach. So the depth psychological approach works a lot on the uh, hypothesis of, on the, of the unconscious, that what motivates you, uh, the reason you're feeling distressed, uh, the reason that you're sitting on the psychoanalyst's couch, for example, is not fully known to you. Um, that a lot of it comes from the unconscious and that um, and the process of analysis is to try and understand what I the unconscious content in fact is and why you are distressed and what you're doing there. All right. Okay. Uh, and I yeah. think I think most people who have any I any idea of uh -huh. of psychology would, would understand uh, that that kind of uh, definition. Now let's let's move on to um, on to the Oscar Pistorius trial. And first of all, let's talk about the mental toughness and the, the the mental capability of a person who is under stress, under duress as well, sitting in a witness box, um, getting asked a tremendous amount of questions. How the way that you've observed it, Stephen? How do you see Oscar Pistorius um, handling what it, what he's going through at present uh, in in the dock? Not very well. Um, 
I think that firstly, in terms, I like what you said about uh, uh, a du- you know stress and duress, or mm-hmm. I'm not quite sure you used another word, something and duress. But I thought duress is the right is the right sort of description. I think he's, I mean, he's been today. I think, he's, if I'm not mistaken, is his fifth day. Yeah, of um, of being in the witness box, uh, of which the vast majority, of course, has been cross examination. So uh, I think that's going to be tough for anyone. Uh, that's not easy. Obviously, that is a really, really tough situation to be in. I certainly wouldn't like to be on the receiving end of Harry Nell's cross-examination. Sure. That being said, I don't think he's handling it well. Um, I think that he's, he's really, really struggling. Okay. And I, it, 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 you know, I've, I've sat and, and tried to you know, discuss this with, with uh, colleagues and, and friends around. If you are so convinced of the truth mm. from a... You know, from an observation, psychological point of view, surely it can't be that difficult to just explain as opposed to what I am interpreting going round and round in circles. And and one has to try and be objective with the questioning mm. that he is getting from Harry mm, Nell mm. because there, there are times where it's just repeat, repeat, repeat. But if you are so convinced of what or you're so convinced you're innocent, okay, Surely a, one's demeanor would come across differently. Yes, I, I think I'm inclined to agree. Um, he, he's, he's, he hasn't been a convincing witness because of that reason. Um, as Harry Nell has often said during the course of the case, he, he always seems to be arguing or putting forward a version or giving much lengthier answers. He seems to hate the straight yes or no, which, which seems strange. If, if he's genuinely just telling, you know, if he's just putting forward what exact happened, then, then why, why are you unable to answer yes or no to more questions? Um, so I agree with you. I think that, w- and, and I think that's a natural assumption. We really do believe that if you're being completely honest, completely forthcoming, uh, that it should not be that stressful and you should not have so much difficulty in answering so many questions. I mean, having said that, of course, we're speculating. I mean, the, yes. the, the whole point of the case is to determine whether he is in fact telling the truth. But assuming he is telling the truth, um, it, it, I don't know. It's, it's difficult to get your mind around it because he really is struggling. He's... Um, He's dodging questions. There's a lot of selective memory. This uh, this constant thing of of not constant, but this very very frequent breaking down in tears, traumatized. Ca- you know, having to st- take these adjournments. All of this from someone who's being completely honest and forthcoming. It's a little hard to swallow. Okay, and and how? I mean, from from a psychological point of view, how how do you interpret that? I mean, you're basically saying it's it's difficult to 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 swallow. But I mean, you know, w- I'm. We've got to try and also give a fair reflection on on his his side as well, and we'll mm. get to him as mm. well. But mm. how does you know? How do you sit there and, and look at it and go, man? Do you need help? I, is he is he um, suicidal? It's strange, strange that you ask that. I was thinking that exact thought. Uh, I wonder if he is. Uh, I wonder if he's being observed. I wonder if, if anyone is concerned about that. Certainly, if I was in his defence counsel or one of his family, yeah. I would be concerned about that. He strikes me as being a. I mean, I don't want to say he strikes me as being suicidal. That, that's going too far. Okay. But I certainly wouldn't be surprised were he suicidal at this point. Um, but to try and answer your question, I think that, I think that he, it, it, he, he claims he's traumatized and he's, he's clearly sort of su- saying that he's suffering from some sort of post-stress traumatic uh, disorder. Yes. Um, and, and in that, I think we can be sympathetic. I think that it was a very traumatic event, even by his own account. Sure. And it's understandable that there would be some, uh, you know, uh, post-stress traumatic disorder. But it seems excessive. I mean, you, you spoke earlier on about, you asked the question about mental toughness. I mean, if one yeah. looks at a man like Oscar, he's, he's clearly an intelligent man. Sure. Um, he's clearly someone who, who I think would need tremendous mental toughness to have achieved what he's achieved. I mean, he's a global or he was a global icon. He achieved something that mm. really no one had achieved before. Uh, and to, to do what he did and to have you know, overcome the obstacles that he did and to have got to the heart of his sport, I think requires tremendous, tremendous mental strength. And uh, that mental strength just seems seemingly absent to a large degree during the course of this trial. Uh, yeah, I mean, there, there's so many brilliant questions. Uh, memory loss, mm-hmm. okay, and mm-hmm. uh, uh, and and shock. Mm-hmm. A, a hugely traumatic event happens in somebody's life, mm-hmm. and we'll be specific with Oscar Pistorius, um, or some somebody has a, a similar traumatic experience comes to see you. How uh, are they uh, connected? Are they associated? Could could someone blank out and forget? so many things and then maybe perhaps only after months or years of psychoanalysis could these things come out yes 
Yes, okay, def- so definitely a memory loss um, or even selective memory loss is, uh, is, 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 is often a symptom of yeah. severe trauma. Uh, and so that disassociation that you've brought up, I think, is not uh, unusual. Uh, I think it does, in fact, happen. Okay, now that's the word, disassociation, where um, this was the thing that just just sparked with me Mm. when when I heard you speaking Mm. the other night. Mm. Can you just explain to us what this, how this disassociation works? The idea is that uh, in psychoanalysis, uh, we look at the personality as a multiplicity, not as in the the, the normal singular intuitive sense, the way you normally think of yourself as one singular, cohesive, sovereign uh, person. Okay. Uh, of course, l- as a legal entity, you are, and that's why he's on the dock answering for his actions. But psychologically, um, you often have very different uh, motivations, very different um, impulses that animate you. Um, and I, it m- it's my impression, and I've written about this, is that Oscar is in fact disassociated from his actions, whether in fact he uh, is guilty as the state is charging, or even if his version of events is true. Um, I think that his his inability or lack of willingness to take responsibility for any aspect of the event. I mean, to the point now that uh, his defense has now become unclear. I mean, it's not even clear whether he in fact intended to shoot the intruder. And uh, you're not quite yeah. sure is he saying it as a sort of an automatic uh, accidental discharge of the weapon or did he actually intend to shoot. So this complete denial, this complete inability to own his um, actions, um, psychoanalytically is very troubling. And it's, w- it's what we call disassociation. It's when you you deny uh, something that you've done to such an extent that you in fact disassociate from it. You become convinced of your own version of events uh, irrespective of the truth of the matter. Uh, and that, that, that I find completely fascinating. So I'm, you're basically saying you, you completely believe your own story or, or own uh, period of events um, and that's, that's what you're going, going to stick to. Is the, could this be where perhaps the defense could step in and say, listen, we think we have a very troubled witness and we think he should go under psychoanalysis or psych- psychiatric treatment? Uh, well, I mean, at the, yeah, at the very least, a full psychiatric evaluation. Okay. Um, in fact, uh, a, a woman by the name of Hanley Roth, who, who I happen to know, who was on uh, the, the channel 199 the other day as well, mm. even made the point, it seems to be so severe, she even spoke about the possibility of some sort of frontal lobe damage. Apparently, he was involved in quite a serious boating accident a number Correct. of years ago. So certainly, um, I, I'm inclined to agree that it, it seems really strange. I'm actually very surprised that a complete psychiatric evaluation wasn't done by the defense um, prior Prior to to. going into the trial. I don't know. I I mean, I guess they're pretty entrenched in their position at this point. Um, And, you know, I don't understand all the intricacies of the legal process. It may be a little difficult for them to, you know, just all of a sudden change track. Yes. But but my impression, honestly, my my professional opinion is that there is some some sort of disorder. There's some sort of pathology at play. I don't believe he's uh, fully functional and fully in possession of his wits. uh, um, uh, could that be because of the the incredible uh, pressure or stress that he's under by having to be in the the witness box? Could it all could it be also that the medication that he's on could this be affecting him in any way from your your position? Yes, uh, uh, it it could. But um, my my reading and this is speculative, but my yes, reading uh, yeah. of the event is that um, it's very hard to imagine that. Um, this is a case of cold-blooded murder. I mean, even, even if the state's case is true, it would seem to be a crime of passion. My, my belief is that there's been a severe disassociation even at the point of the shooting. In other words, I think this pathology predates the case. I think he, the shooting has occurred because there's some sort of pathology at play. No, I, th- I, th- I think that's brilliant. Uh, going, let, let's go back a little bit I- I in the trial, and, and you mentioned the whole um, aspect of denial. Mm. Um, there were a couple of instances, and I'd like to get to how you read into it. And maybe this also goes falls in with with disassociation. But he was he was there was the the gunshot that went off in a restaurant. Mm. There's a gunshot that went off uh, through a, a roof uh, sunroof, a sunroof of, of, a, of a car, and yet it comes down to the two things: denial and. And passing, passing the buck, taking no responsibility. How do you see that? I mean, are they all? Li- well, they must be linked somewhere along the line. 
<laughs> Look, I'm not sure. Look, I think I think that certainly what Harry Nell is trying to okay, okay, point yeah, towards. Okay, maybe that's more of a criminologist kind yeah, of question. Yeah, I think that's what he's trying to point towards. Uh, it seems what seems incredulous. I mean, I've been watching, I've been following the trial very closely. And what yeah. really is, is, is this case you brought up, this case of the Tash's restaurant. Yes. Now, the ballistics es- expert for the state, um, Mungena, I think yeah. his name is, if I'm not mistaken, he testified, and he's an expert ballis- you know, he's yeah. an expert in ballistics. He testified that, in fact, for that particular weapon, the Glock, there is no way for the weapon to discharge without the trigger being depressed. Okay. And, uh, and yet, you know, in the face of that, Oscar maintains that he certainly didn't place his finger on the trigger. So, so it's, it's, you know, I mean, to the point that Henry you didn't know if you, there, was a, there was a hint of irony in it. He said, you think someone else may have reached under the table yeah. and depressed the trigger. So, you know, he's obviously trying to draw a link here. He has, he has someone who is, is either consciously, uh, you know, lying and lying uh, very badly or, or otherwise, I mean, I'm not sure what, what the state's position is on this. Otherwise, there is some sort of serious disassociation, some sort of inability to connect himself with the discharge of the weapon yeah i think that that that's where i'm, I'm coming to i mean because you know i don't want to put, put uh, questions to you that are much more legal but it, mine is is this complete disassociation mm. complete denial of everything mm. um and and the one thing that i found uh, and and from your observation is yes there's been emotional outbreaks there's been crying there's been throwing up there's you know there's been a whole multitude of different uh, physical attributes that have happened to to Oscar Pistorius mm. is that and in my opinion I don't think so but is that remorse for what has happened or is it more remorse for himself if you look at it my reading is it's it's remorse for himself i think he i really think that he is in a nightmare nightmarish scenario um whether whether the the shooting was intentional or accidental he's 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 living a nightmare he's, uh, everything he's worked for his whole life mm. and i think he worked bloody hard for it has been wiped out and uh he's in mourning he uh, he probably i i i concede he, he he probably is in mourning for Riva, regardless of the fact that he yes. killed her i do think he's traumatized by that but certainly yes i think he's deeply uh, traumatized and sad and remorseful f- for the loss of what used to be Oscar Pistorius. Very sad. Is uh, you know, no, uh, it seems that like we're just bashing the, the the this poor man who's uh, on the on the stand. Is there anything positive for Oscar? I mean, from what you can see at, at, at present, yes, okay, he's under the cosh with the, with with Harry Nell, but Barry Ruiz is, is going to come back. Do you think there's anything that that all of a sudden we might see a different kind of Oscar? Does Oscar have anything left to offer for people to to? Um, I, I, I think there are people who have got sides, but is there anything who that Oscar can do that that will maybe sway a lot of those who are against him? To be to be for him. I mean, is is there anything you can see in him? Not that I can see. I mean, I'm sorry to put it so so bluntly, but no, I, I don't think so. I mean, at this point, I suppose um, coming clean and confessing would probably be um, may, maybe one way to go. But the problem is, he's so entrenched in his version at this point that mm. that even if he were to confess, he's just. I think he's lost all credibility. I think that his defence has taken a particular track. Um, a number of lawyers have come up and said they thought he received incredibly bad legal advice. Is that so? Um, and uh, he, this complete denial, complete lack of taking responsibility. At this point, I wish I could say there was something he could do, but my, but my impression is he's dug a very, very deep hole for himself. Is that, and, and uh, it comes back to the memory loss, uh, shock, uh, the vagueness of the answers, you know, that, as you say, that disassociation mm-hmm. where he can remember certain things but he can't remember other things now yeah. earlier you said that could be an event of memory loss but in in patients that maybe you've dealt with do, is this familiar is it something that you see regularly well let's put it this way i think that um to to what you know once again i go back to his achievements and what he's done yeah um and i think that if one looks at oscar as a person um, he has a, a, a boy, a young boy, a young man growing up that, in a sense, had to disconnect from what, in psychoanalytic terms, we call the reality principle. He had to create a narrative of his life. He had to change and reimagine himself in a way that no one else could or no one else had previously. He really, I think he really was a global pioneer um, sure. for differently abled athletes. 
Um, and also sport generally, I think, involves a high degree of disassociation, disassociation from pain, disasso disassociation from doubt, etc. And this kind of focusing and very selective, um, not only memory, but selective attention. And sometimes you notice when he's describing these events, uh, and Henry Nels pointed this out a number of times, he seems to have a very, very high degree of uh, recollection of certain specific aspects and then it's as if there's just absolutely no recollection of other aspects yeah. now now obviously Harry Nell is saying look this is selective evidence but um, ma but maybe one could say that he that, that that to some extent his attention is selective and that uh, there's certain aspects that whether he's willfully forgotten them or they've just been repressed I'm not quite certain but this 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 idea of a narrow um, very targeted focus of attention I think fits in with um, his, his psychological training as, a, as an athlete. Yeah, I think that's also very, very important because he would have undergone so much, mm -hmm. you know, from coaches, from uh, psychologists or whatever to be the best, yes. to, you know, and, and, and to uh, overcome the odds he overcame. That's it. I mean, it, it's, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's quite fascinating. But unfortunately, at this stage under cross-examination, I mean, Stephen, we, we've got to say that... Uh, it's not going um, as well as, as perhaps uh, everyone or his team or even himself uh, thought so. Yeah, I don't think so. I think it's going really badly and it seems to be getting worse. I mean, uh, watching this morning, I could barely watch. It's got to the point where it's, it's, uh, it's, it's really, it's, it's so brutal and it's so bloody and it's becoming so far-fetched that uh, it's, 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 it's actually difficult to keep following the trial. I mean, that's my personal reaction, but yeah. I just I, I feel a degree of sympathy for him, whatever, whatever happened. I don't believe he was in, uh, you know, I don't believe he had his full capacities about him at the time of shooting, and I don't believe he does now. Yeah. And, and yet he's being obliged to take responsibility, and maybe that's right. I mean, our legal system demands that he does take responsibility. But uh, I really believe that his, uh, his capacity to give evidence and his capacity at the time of shooting were severely diminished. And yet he's got to deal with the consequences. And I think it's quite tragic to watch. I think it, it is extremely, extremely tragic. Yeah. There, Stephen, I just want to keep you a couple more minutes. One of, one of the terms that have, have come up during this trial, narcissistic. Um, and, and the other one I, I want to do, um, compulsive liar. Have you dealt in, in treatment of, of, of patients or whatever, dealing with somebody who is a compulsive liar, basically complete disassociation? How does one identify that, differentiate it, and, and is there a way that you can change it? Well, in psychoanalysis, we like to believe that it, it can be dealt with. Uh, we obviously believe in the psychoanalytic and the therapeutic approach. And, uh, and I do think that, um, that people can learn to take responsibility for their actions and, and, and discover maybe a moral compass where one is missing. Um, having said that, this, this, this diagnosis or this um, diagnosis, probably going a bit far, but this comment from a number of people about narcissistic uh, mm, personality mm. disorder, yes, it does seem to apply. It does, uh, one, one does have the impression watching it that um, the greatest level of remorse and sadness that he's currently experiencing is for his own situation rather than the fact that he's taken this young woman's life, whether he took it intentionally or accidentally. I mean... He just doesn't seem to. One doesn't have the impression that there's a genuine uh, remorse. And, and uh, assuming that that's correct, that, that is very suggestive of uh, certainly what, you know, severe degree of narcissism. Sure. Well, I tell you, Stephen, uh, thanks very much uh, for coming in and, and uh, joining us. Ties, you got any questions? No. Are you sure? <laughs> Daisy's very much pro uh, pro Oscar. Oh, really? Yeah. So, sorry. Which, <laughs> <laughs> sorry about my No, it's <laughs> just like, I, uh, no, it's been very interesting <laughs> listening <laughs> to what you say because <laughs> I see it from a totally different side. <laughs> like, I would have put the questions differently. <laughs> so, it's interesting, very interesting to hear what no, you No, but then ask the questions. No, I don't want to get into it. No, I don't want to. Okay, well, we're just having a, we're looking at the psyche of a man uh, seem, seemingly in, in, uh, in quite a lot of trouble I think so. uh, yeah. at the moment. Yeah. Stephen, thank you very much for, uh, for coming in here. And uh, um, when maybe this is all over, maybe let's have a chat again, you know, and, and uh, sit there and maybe analyze it uh, even further. Absolutely. Thanks very much for inviting me. Much appreciated. No, anytime. There we go. Stephen Farrah. And of course, uh, you can go and check everything out on their website which of course is www.appliedyoung.com Gears Gears on balls.co.za Weekdays 1pm to 3pm